Hey again, everyone. So now that we've dealt with transformations of functions, we're going to talk about taking the inverse of a function. So we did an investigation today where you looked at inverses of functions and the properties of the inverse of a function, and we're going to outline those briefly here before we actually learn how to take the inverse of a function. So as we know, if we have a function, which we're going to call f of x, then if we want to take the inverse of this function, we're going to denote it f with a little negative 1 of x, which can be read as the inverse of f of x, or more commonly, the or f inverse of x. So that negative 1 is not an exponent. Um, it's a superscript, and it, in, it indicates that you're talking about an inverse of a function. It works kind of like how, when you're doing the opposite of sine, cosine, or tangent, uh, you can take the sine inverse, the cosine inverse, or the tangent inverse. Okay, So it's not an exponent of negative 1. So one of the properties that you talked about with the inverse of a function is going to involve the graph. So suppose I have a graph, uh, and I have, in this case, two functions. I have two parabolas. One opens up and one opens to the right. So if the green function is my function f of x, then the blue function is going to be my function f inverse of x. Now, a function f of x and its inverse f inverse of x uh, are going to have graphs which are related in some interesting way. You're going to notice that f of x and f inverse of x are reflections of one another about a special line, and that line is y is equal to x. So if you were to reflect f of x in the line y is equal to x, you would end up with a graph that looks like f inverse of x. Okay. Um, you also found out that uh, the x values and y values are kind of switched between a function and its inverse. So uh, if you were to make a table of values for f of x and then a table of values for f inverse of x, all the x values that you would get for your function f of x would be the y values for your function uh, in f inverse of x, and all the y values from f of x would be the x values from f, inver uh, f inverse of x. So they'd be switched essentially, right? And another way of saying that is that the domain and range of f of x uh, get switched uh, in f inverse of x. So the domain of f of x is the range of f inverse of x, and the range of f inver inverse of x is the domain of f of x, okay? And we're going to use that bit of information to take the inverse in a moment. So, finding the inverse of a function. I know that you guys went through and found the inverse of a couple of functions today, and you relied on recognizing the operations in a function and then reversing them. Uh, there's a little bit of a nicer way to do it that will be, uh, I would say, a little bit quicker and a little bit cleaner. So, let's go through an example. So let's suppose we have f of x uh, is equal to 2x minus 8, so a linear function, and suppose we wanted to find f inverse of x. So again, you could do this conceptually by recognizing the operations and reversing them, but here's how we're going to do it this time. So step number one, we're going to replace f of x with y to put this into xy notation. This is just a little bit cleaner looking with xy notation. So instead of writing f of x is equal to 2x minus 8, I'm going to write y is equal to 2x minus 8. Okay, and then next step. Well, we know that the domain and the range get switched when you take the inverse, which means that the x values and the y values get switched uh, for the inverse. So, to find the inverse, we're going to actually switch the x and the y values in our equation, right? So where y was, we would put x, and where x was, we put y. Okay, and that's going to essentially switch the domain and range of the function, which is what we require, okay? From here on out, all we need to do is we need to isolate for y again. Okay, now that we've moved it to where the x was, we're going to re-isolate for y. So I'm going to start by adding 8 to both sides, and that gives me x plus 8 is equal to 2y. And then to get rid of the 2 in front of the y, I'm going to divide both sides by 2, and that's going to be x plus 8 divided by 2 is equal to y. Okay, now that we've isolated for y, I can replace y back with the correct notation, which would be f inverse, okay? And that will give us our inverse function. So, therefore, f inverse of x is going to be x plus 8 divided by 2. So that's finding the inverse of a linear function. Uh, now let's talk about finding the inverse of a quadratic function. So let's say I have f of x is equal to 2 times x plus 1 squared minus 3, and we want to find f inverse of x again. Um, now, one thing I want to note uh, for you guys is that when finding the inverse of a quadratic equation, or any qu uh, equation at all, actually, you want to make sure that there is only one y value occurring in the equation and one x value occurring in the equation. Okay? You don't want to see x more than once. You don't want to see y more than once. Um, and because of that, uh, there's only one way of writing uh, the function so that you can take the inverse nicely. Uh, and that is vertex form. 
because in vertex form, you only have one Y, you only have one X, so when you switch them, it'll be nice and easy. Uh, standard form has X occurring more than once, right? You have AX squared plus BX plus C, so you see that X occurs more than once, so that's not going to work really nicely. Uh, and same thing with factored form. Factored form is A times X minus R times X minus S, so since you see X more than once, not going to work nicely. So we want to use vertex form, and that means that if you don't have it in vertex form, you want to put it in vertex form first. Okay, so this one's already in vertex form, so let's proceed exactly the same way. I'm going to replace f of x with y to put this back into xy notation, make things a little bit cleaner. And then for the inverse, I'm going to switch my x and y in my equation, so where x was, I replace it with y, and where y was, I replace it with x. And the rest of the question is going to involve isolating for y again. So to do that, I'm going to add 3 to both sides. That gives me x plus 3 equals 2 times y plus 1 squared. Next, I want to get rid of the 2 out front. So I'm going to divide both sides by 2. And that's going to leave me with x plus 3 over 2 is equal to y plus 1 squared. Then I want to get rid of that squared, and the opposite of squaring something is taking plus or minus the square root, so I get plus or minus the square root of x plus 3 over 2 is equal to y plus 1. And then lastly, I need to get rid of that plus 1, which means I can subtract 1 from both sides, and that leaves me with negative 1 plus or minus the square root of x plus 3 divided by 2 is equal to y. And now that y has been isolated for, uh, I can switch back to... Uh, f of x notation, my function notation, by replacing y with f inverse of x. And so that leaves me with f inverse of x is equal to negative 1 plus or minus the square root of x plus 3 divided by 2. So this is the method that you're going to use to find an inverse. You switch back to xy notation. You switch the x and the y values to switch up the domain and range. You re-isolate for y, and then you can put it back into function notation. Okay, guys? So we'll practice some of these tomorrow. Uh, I hope that this has been useful to you. Take care.